This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Last week, Argentina's newly elected libertarian president, Javier Millet, gave quite the speech at the World Economic Forum's annual conference in Davos. Uh, The speech drew a lot of attention in the media and online, at least our corner of the (laughs) social media world, because the World Economic Forum has earned a reputation as kind of the ultimate global elite clubhouse in a world turning increasingly populist and nationalist. So where exactly does Millet fit into this new world? For this episode, Liz and I wanted to go through his speech together and try to figure that out. And we've invited Argentine Argentine political scientist Marcos Falcone, who's project manager at Argentina's Fundacion Libertad, to help us out with that. Marcos, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Zach and Liz, for the invitation. Sure. And, you know, before we get into the speech itself, I thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about the World Economic Forum and uh, what it stands for, what its goals are, and kind of talk about Millet's presence at that conference in in Davos. Um, Millet's introduction was given by none other than our favorite (laughs) <laughs> super villain-esque German professor, Klaus Schwab, founder of the WF. Let's hear a little bit of uh, Schwab's introduction. It's for me a great, great honor to welcome Javier Millet, as you know, he's the freely elected president of uh, Argentina. I think you, sometimes people would say with more radical methods, but you introduce a new spirit to Argentina, making Argentina much more related to free enterprise, to entrepreneurial activities, also to bring Argentina back to the rule of law. So we have a very extraordinary person among us today, And of course, we are all eager uh, to listen to you. And again, a very cordial welcome to the World Economic Forum. All right. So generally pretty cordial. Millet is is radical, but he's bringing markets and the rule of law to Argentina. So maybe not all that bad. The WF is not contrary to some of the theories out there, some sort of you know communist organization. They're not reflexively hostile to markets. They just, in my view, uh, look at them as tools to achieve certain social ends because they're corporatists. Um, and I have to imagine, you know, having watched the speech, that he was not expecting what happened next, because uh, we'll see soon that Malay goes directly for the jugular at, of what the WF is actually all about. Um, or, or maybe he doesn't just, he just doesn't care. He, he's 85 years old. Maybe, you know, just want to YOLO, spice things up, see what happens. Any thoughts, uh, Liz or Marcos, about just kind of the WEF, Klaus Schwab, Davos, I mean, they're sort of cringe technocratic central planners. Um, So I have to believe that with the amount of control they exert over the rest of us, surely they exerted lots of control over pre-vetting the speeches, which makes me think that Malay went off script a little bit. Um, I don't know, you know, whether or not that's true. There's not really any indication as to what happened, but that's sort of the only explanation I can come up with that explains how Malay got so delightfully fiery uh, in his speech in a way that is sort of an indictment of some of the things Klaus Schwab stands for. What about you, Marcos? Does the WEF, like, what does it, what does it mean to you, if anything, as someone who's living through the economic turmoil in Argentina? Um, it doesn't really mean much to me personally. Um, but here in Argentina, there was a lot of expectation about Millet's uh, speech, particularly because um, of the of the idea that it could mirror the speech that uh, former President Macri gave in 2016 when he took office. When he yeah, 
he he had just taken office like one month prior, just like Millet. Uh, and back then, this was like uh, like the reintroduction of Argentina into the world stage, right? Into the world of free mm -hmm. enterprise. And so there was some expectation as to um, whether Millet would mirror that speech or or whether he would go um, off script, as Liz said. Although, it, I mean, we'll talk about the speech later, but the speech itself is not that different from the speech that we uh, as Argentines have been hearing um, consistently from Millet in the past years. Uh, it's remarkably similar to um, lectures that he has given out loud to whoever would listen um, in different cities in the country. I was actually part of one of them um, in my hometown, Mar del Plata, in the summer of I think it was 2023 last year. Um, he he was just touring the country, you know, and lecturing about economics and freedom. Um, and and some of the contents of those lectures were remarkably similar to the speech that we saw at Davos. So, hmm. to what degree did this actually mirror Macri's speech? Well, um, I I would say that it did in that uh, they both favored uh, free enterprise and freedom in, in you know on paper uh, but Millet went after uh, the the w um, wef uh, scores values or not core values but many of the interests that they have taken in in past years uh, in a way that Macri did not I mean Macri was all for you know um, fighting climate change and and the progressive agenda in terms of uh, civil liberties, uh, whereas Millet was clearly, uh, like he, he opposed all of that. He was clearly against all of that. So, and he was much more radical in arguing in favor of capitalism because Macri's speech um, resembled, you know, this idea of Klaus Schwab and others that um, capitalism is at the service of something else, you know, that we value capitalism because of the, because it is a means uh, to, to a different end. Whereas Millet argued, in, in my view at least, that capitalism is, is good in itself because it allows us to do whatever we want with them, uh, which is not, I think, uh, what the World Economic Forum stands for. So in that regard, it did not mirror uh, Macri's speech. There, there were similarities and dissimilarities, but um, I think this, this was a much more radical speech, which is what I would expect uh, from a libertarian uh, and yeah. then anarcho-capitalist president. Yeah, and that's why I think it's it is important going into this to understand uh, the the values of the WEF and and to not get distracted by some of the strange uh, theories about the WEF. And I'll I'll not so humbly recommend uh, one of my previous videos on this called uh, "Forget the Great Reset, Embrace the Great Escape." That I, I, that kind of lays out what the WEF is actually all about, um, which is not uh, necessarily a like nefarious um, agenda to turn us all into like transhuman AIs or something like that, but more so a kind of that managed, be that bad. <laughs> a kind of managed version of capitalism that has become known as stakeholder capitalism, where you uh, in you put aside kind of the previous like Milton Friedman conception of capitalism as just delivering value to the shareholders of a company to expanding the mandate of a company to deliver uh, to so-called stakeholders, which could be um, environmentalist groups or labor groups or any other kind of interest group that you could come up with. Here at it domestically, Elizabeth Warren has been one of the outspoken proponents of this. She's uh, proposed, you know, I think 40% worker ownership uh, or worker representation on corporate boards in California. There's been attempts to kind of rebalance what a what a corporate board looks like. And so that's why I ultimately describe them as corporatist. And I think in kind of the, the furthest, the, the most uh, extreme uh, instantiation or example example of like where where this heads would be China, where they actually put 
government, uh, you know, party officials on the corporate boards. So the stakeholder is actually the government itself. And that gets into, you know, outright fascism. So it can lead to really bad places. Um, China has like before... the opposite of separation of state and business. It's all so disturbingly intermingled in a way that I think a lot of Western audiences just totally uh, misunderstand. You're yeah. Right. And uh, in the at the 2022 Davos conference, um, Xi Jinping was the kind of keynote speaker who kicked off the conference and uh, Klaus gave him a, a fairly glowing introduction there as well, which I, I found kind of disturbing. But um, before we move into Malay's speech, uh, let's play one more clip just to get now that I think we've laid out a little bit of, of what the WF is about and what Davos is about. Um, Klaus Schwab actually is on the record uh, with his opinion about libertarians and where libertarianism fits into the new world order. Uh, so let's uh, roll that clip from uh, the 2017 World Government Summit in Dubai. We are at historical crossroads. We face a backlash of millions of people, particularly in the West, who feels that globalization is not working. Fixing the present system is not enough. Now, there is, of course, a anti-system, which is called libertarianism which means to tear down everything which creates some kind of influence of government into private lives. It's demantling the system, and we see certain elements of this now in the new US administration. If we want to go forward, we need a completely new thinking. We have to integrate into our future policy making is the notion of multi-stakeholder concept. The big challenges which we have cannot be solved by governments alone, but they cannot be solved by business or civil society alone. We need new ways of cooperation, of very flexible cooperation. I wish you a very good world government summit thank you <laughs> so, okay so again yeah, new flexible ways of cooperation uh between public and private that, that's kind of what i was alluding to earlier and then you know his assertion that libertarians are anti-system which you know we are yeah we are anti your system the one you're selling to a bunch of monarchs in the uae uh, that <laughs> leads you to open your conferences with odes to the wisdom of Xi Jinping. I, I could not imagine a better endorsement, honestly. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, again, want to be really clear about what the WF is and isn't. Um, and, you know, e even Klaus uh, Schwab uh, has acknowledged, you know, these these changes in that these technological changes uh, that have driven political changes and made it much harder to have top-down control. So he does at times talk about the need for subsidiarity, the, the, the need to uh, have, you know, more localized versions of control. And um, it, it, he's, he's not really at this point advocating for some sort of one world government, but more so that uh, local and national governments kind of come in under the WF umbrella and kind of we we have this common view of of governance and these sort of common uh tools and and consensus to kind of manage the future uh but uh, I just want to open the floor to both of you for any additional reactions to Klaus's view of libertarianism um, I have a lot of disdain for Klaus Schwab's description of libertarianism. I think, first of all, libertarians exist on this massive, glorious spectrum. There's obviously Rothbardian and cap types who very much hate the state and do want to smash the system uh, in a very major way. 
There are also, I think, on the other side of the spectrum, a bunch of libertarians who look at the current system, which involves an awful lot of crony capitalism and subsidies doled out to uh, various companies that are sort of in these bidding wars for contracts with the government. And they look at that and they say, why is it that any time um, government sort of taints everything that it touches, uh, you know, any time we look at a project either done in co collaboration with a government or by a government agency itself, we see it completed, um, you know, two years later than they had anticipated and massively over budget in any other sector that would be totally uh, unacceptable. And so a lot of libertarians look at the state of affairs at present and say, well, government, like, look at the results. Government is not in many cases delivering to nearly the degree that they say they will. And to us, that indicates that we need to privatize more things and allow markets to, um, you know, conduct more affairs than the government. The thing is, libertarians, I think, are so frequently portrayed as these like naive people who think that absolutely everything will be perfectly solved once we get the government out of the way. And I think libertarians actually frequently realize that there will be short-term pain points in the same way that I think Malay is sort of setting Argentina up for realizing that that is what will happen in order to get inflation under control. In the short term, there will be massive unemployment. There will continue to be people living, you know, 40% of the country below the poverty line, right? Like that is not going away tomorrow, but he will move things in the right direction and will pursue a means of getting inflation under control. And I think libertarians, that's the thing that people really miss. So I think Klaus Schwab is totally misrepresenting what libertarians stand for and a lot of the critiques that we make. And he's placing an extraordinary amount of faith in government collaboration as a thing that, um, you know, creates efficiency uh, and creates good results. And I think I'm interested in what results he's looking to because I don't see it. Yeah. And Klaus, uh, I mean, uh, Millet as the first uh, kind of self-described elected libertarian head of state is now starting to be a stand-in for a lot of, for, you know, that, well, I guess we're going to start to see what libertarian governance looks like for the first time. And, you know, you talked about all these different types and strains of libertarianism, Liz, and Millet is an interesting blend of several of these strains, maybe a synthesis. Uh, and well, could, could you just talk about, yeah. He's a practical ANCAP, right? Like he is in what he actually believes, an anarcho-capitalist, uh, and that yet he also realizes that he actually must get stuff done and that there will be a long transition from the current system that Argentina has to where he's looking to go. Yeah. Could he's you talk a little bit about that, Marcos, the blend or the type of libertarian in that uh, Millet has been as a sort of public intellectual and now is as a elected politician or he, he was elected politician before, but elected have state. Well, he's definitely pragmatic uh, because uh, when he was campaigning, he was all for, uh, well, of course, you know, anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism. Um, but now that he's president, um, he doesn't talk publicly that much. I mean, the Davos speech was actually one of the few instances in which we have uh, listened uh, to Millet since he became president. The other important time was when he took office and he delivered a speech that was, um, that was libertarian spirit in which he also warned about uh, not just short term or, or, or a bit of pain, but he warned of a lot of pain because of the situation uh, in which the country uh, finds itself. Uh, but, but it's interesting because this, this, the, the measures that Millet is proposing through a decree first in late, September, uh, late December, uh, now uh, through a law, through an omnibus bill that is being discussed in the House of Representatives, which we can talk about later, um, yeah. are libertarian in some aspects and in some aspects, uh, not so much, right? So he, he is pushing for deregulation to a point that no prior government has ever done. Um, and, and that is extremely positive. And he's trying to go against crony capitalism. Um, and he's trying to go against, you know, these corporatists that say that they, that they claim they defend capitalism, but they don't. They just defend their own businesses. Um, and in some aspects, Millet is just being orthodox, you know, and, and not that libertarian, but rather um, classic conservative, right? Like trying to mm -hmm. achieve, for example, um, 
um, a fiscal balance. Argentina, in, I mean, he inherited a fiscal deficit that, that is pretty high, and he's now trying to reduce public spending, but also increase uh, taxation. Um, so it, it, it's funny because he claimed, Millet claimed before the election that he would cut his arm before uh, sending, before proposing uh, a tax hike, but his government actually is proposing a tax hike right now. So a tax hike um, on who? Th those are exports well, and imports. Is that right? Well, yes, on, ex on yeah. many exports. Uh, yeah. Although there's negotiation in Congress uh, which has eliminated uh, these taxes for some sectors, uh, but also today, uh, as we speak, uh, the government is sending out. Um, a law uh, on the income tax that was repealed, I think it was four months ago, with the votes of Millet himself in Congress while he was campaigning. Um, the government will, is now trying to reintroduce the income tax, and of course it's going to try to make it um, much, uh, I mean, it's trying to make it less uh, costly for the families, for individuals, but it is that it is definitely reintroducing. There's no way around it. Um, so that that's why I'm saying in many aspects. I assume this is because is definitely... I assume this is because yeah. they are in such a fiscal hole right now. Correct. Was, Correct. As you said, dug by his predecessors, that they're doing everything they can to Correct. balance that budget, and that in the short term at least is going to require both raising revenues and uh, you know cutting spending. Um, and, Correct. Well, have we yeah. checked? That's why they, they're they're also off, right. Like maybe he's making good on his promises. Yeah, is he a one-armed president now? Uh, just, you know. <laughs> Who knows? Um, yeah. But but th that's why the government is also proposing that taxes go down mm -hmm. after next year, uh, after 2025, so that the country stabilizes this year, and the next year uh, the government can continue with the with the with the downtrend in terms of uh, of revenue. Uh, but so yeah. far, you know that there's going to be pain. He said there would be pain. Um, and well, the, the the unions are actually protesting today. Uh, Millet's got his first um, general strike, national strike, on Wednesday, January twenty fourth. Um, only forty days, forty less than forty five days after he took office, unions have uh, never done uh, anything like this. Uh, they waited for five years before um, striking w with the. Christina Kirchner government, for example. So yeah. you can imagine that there's going to be turmoil and protesting, and there definitely is. What yeah. will this and accomplish? I, I wanna... so the, the protests in the streets, I, I want to talk about this more later, but I'm curious, like, you know, I was reading about how it's some like 200,000 who are expected to be protesting in the streets of Buenos Aires today. Um, and obviously people protesting all around other Argentine cities, but also like there's a massive protest planned in like Berlin for Argentine expats living there. I know New York City has protests planned where I live. San Francisco has protests, right? Like this is a, a massive thing. But what does this do? Is it just this work stoppage? Uh, I mean, I know unions have a lot of power in Argentina, but Marcos, what, what's the effect going to be? Yeah, they basically uh, try to prevent workers from going to work. So the, yeah. this is why if if people who, if demonstrators find open um, stores, for example, in downtown Buenos Aires, they will probably try to force them to close. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's kind of ridiculous. The government has actually um, uh, called, I mean, the, the government um, put in place a phone line where people can denounce whether they're being forced to uh, stay at home and not go to work uh, by a union representative. And they claim that they have received more than 60,000 reports of people who have been threatened not to go to work because the country needs to strike against Malay. Um, so there's a lot of violence involved, uh, implicit and explicit, in this strike. But what they try to accomplish is mostly symbolic, I would say. Uh, since the omnibus bill is scheduled to uh, be uh, well, debated and then possibly approved uh, shortly, they want to show that there is uh, unrest, that the people are against this law, that the law shouldn't pass, that the decree that Millet signed in late, September, uh, late December um, must be overturned by the courts, 
uh, and they want to show the world, and this is why they all, they're also striking in San Francisco, New York, Berlin, Rome. They want to show the world how terrible, you know, uh, Malay's policies are, which of course they're not. Um, but but this, this is yeah. typical. They did this to Macri too, even when Macri, uh, when Macri's policies were, were not as, you know, as pro-capitalist as Malay's. Uh, so why wouldn't they do this to Malay? Uh, it's it's the, a little the people bit of, who protest. Yeah, it's a little bit of the same as the U.S. phenomenon, which is where for years and years, uh, whenever a presidential election came around and it looked like a Republican was going to win, Democrats would claim this is the most important election of your lifetime. Get out the vote. And so then right. finally, when the Trump phenomenon um, sort of rose up, they were claiming this is the most important election of your lifetime. And I think a lot of people meant it a little bit more. But to some degree, it's this saga of the boy who cried wolf, where it's like, you already did this four years ago, and you're going to do this again in four years. And I'm right. just like, on right. to the whole routine of it. And it seems yeah. like in Argentina, it's kind of the same thing with how angry unions get and the degree to which it's just regardless of whether you're Macri or Malay, they're going to come out in full force and talk about I was seeing some posters circulating that were like, oppose the IMF, the, the, the pro IMF Zionist government of Malay. And it's just like, what like it's really? just nonsense it's just yeah no and as I, I long as the government is not paranist they will protest that's what they and do I, it, and we're, we're going to dig into some of the substance of Malay's legislative agenda and those decrees near the end of the conversation but one thing that um stood out to me in your answer marcos was you were talking about the fact that Malay has not been giving a lot of public statements or speeches since being elected i find that really interesting because it's like when Trump was elected, you know, there's been a lot of comparisons in the media between Trump and Millet, which are largely ill-founded, but I think it's uh, a lot of it's based on their perceived temperaments and their rhetorical style. And there was this big question mark after Trump was first elected of like, okay, now that he's president, is he going to act differently? And the answer was no, not at all. Millet, on the other hand, uh, it seems like he, there is a sort of a pivot and maybe a, a seriousness or, or like devotion to uh, the mission that w or focus that that was not there uh, for Trump. Uh, and so it's it's interesting that his his first one of his first big speeches is is this one. And and I noticed in watching it that it was also and people will see this as we start to play the clips, it seemed a little more controlled. I mean, it was very, you know, he's reading from a script. Um, he's not doing the fiery Malay thing that we see on uh, television clips from his, his campaign and before that. Uh, so let, let's just get right into the speech and, and uh, m make some observations about both the style and substance of what he's saying. So we'll, we'll first run um, his opening statement. Today, I am present to inform you that the Western world is facing a significant threat. It is in danger because those who are supposed to defend the values of the Western world are co-opted by a worldview that inevitably leads to socialism and consequently to poverty and economic deprivation. Unfortunately, so, like you said, this this uh, and I should have mentioned this at the top. We are running a, these clips are actually an AI translated version of Millet that is meant to sound, to approximate the tenor of Millet's voice. So some clever person ran the transcript through one of these AI voice generators and uh, created this, you know, this, this AI approximation of Millet's voice and that it actually sinks his mouth to uh, the word. So this is a weird, you know, uh, 2024 thing that we're doing here. I just wanted to disclaim that uh, as, as loudly and forcefully as possible and mention that as always, we will link to our sources uh, and the original transcript uh, that you, you can watch uh, to, but we, we did check and, you know, it, it's, it's accurate with the transcript that the WF uh, posted, but we just thought for audio and video purposes, this would be like the best way to consume this. Uh, that aside, uh, his opener there really is, like you said, Marcos, consistent with the message we've heard over and over again, which is that 
there, this is uh, kind of an existential battle between um, individualism and collectivism in all its forms. Um, anyone I think, else want to weigh in uh, there before we continue? Yeah. No, I just wanted to say, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Millet was photographed uh, as he was entering the plane that took him to Davos with a copy of Individualism and Economic Order by Friedrich Hayek. Um, so I think that tells you, you know, uh, about the, the spirit that he wanted to convey with that speech, and, and he did. Absolutely. Liz, anything else where you want to keep going? Let's go. I need more Malay. All right. Malay. All right, let's go. In recent decades, motivated by some well-intentioned desires to help others and others by the desire to belong to a privileged caste, the main leaders of the Western world have abandoned the model of freedom for different versions of what we call collectivism. We are here to tell you that collectivist experiments are never the solution to the problems that afflict the citizens of the world, but rather they are their cause. Trust me, there is no one better than us Argentines to provide testimony on these two issues. When we embraced freedom in 1860, in 35 years we became the world's first dominant power. 35 years we became the first world power. While when we embraced collectivism over the past 100 years, we saw how our citizens began to systematically impoverish themselves until they fell to the 140th position in the world, 40 in the world. But before we can have this discussion, it would be important for us to first look at the data that supports why free market capitalism is not only a possible system to end world poverty, but also the only morally desirable system to achieve it. Okay, so he's saying that the arc of Argentina's history there is sort of a, a case study in what happens when you embrace and turn away from free market capitalism. W would you be able to flesh out a little bit of that political and uh, economic history for oh, us, Marcos? Marcos? Just give us the last like 200 years of like your country. <laughs> yeah, take us back. Like, well, <laughs> three minutes. In like, in like two minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Well, but, but Millet is right in that Argentina is a, a, a sadly remarkable example of what happens when you uh, steer away from capitalism and free markets. Uh, Argentina, um, back in the, in the late, nine, in the late uh, 19th century, was among the top economies uh, of the world. Um, it was second only to the U.S. Um, in terms of the countries that received the most immigrants, uh, millions and millions of Europeans, basically, but also people from um, from Asia, uh, came to Argentina uh, during that time. Among them, my own ancestors uh, from Italy and the ancestors of uh, basically all of us who live here today, uh, because this was a country where you could thrive. You know, where you could uh, just you know buy a piece of land and 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 work your way uh, towards the middle class and get yourself a home and buy yourself a home, uh, get a stable job and, and be able to save. And, and this is because Argentina was a country that was open to the world, uh, where trade, international trade was very important. This was a country where um, restrictions to, to economic activities were, were low. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, corporate, uh, corporatism. Um, the, the, the role of the state was very limited. Uh, public spending was not uh, super high. We had no central bank. We had no inflation. Um, and we just basically welcomed anyone who would want to come to Argentina and live here peacefully. Um, beginning in uh, well, the a, great... The thing that stick out to me about Argentina's origin story is it seems like uh, on the note that you're hitting there, there were also, you know, have been for a long time, these like little ethnic enclaves, you know, with so much immigration comes, yes, some amount of assimilation and, and becoming Argentine, but also at the same time, sometimes little communities of expats. And there are still these little towns in Argentina where people speak entirely Italian or entirely German or entirely French or what have you. And I think there's an interesting, correct me at any point if I'm wrong, but I think that that's a really interesting thing. And then also, Argentina used to be pretty like natural resource rich, right? With a lot of agriculture and just like so much to export. Is that correct? Correct. 
Okay. That's correct. Uh, in terms of, um, of assimilation, uh, I would say that the, you know, you having towns where people speak a language different than Spanish, that's not something that you will find today. Uh, you could mm -hmm. find that uh, at the beginning of the 20th century for sure. And you can find towns today um, where, you know, the, the last names of everyone will be German or, you know, <laughs> Italian or, or Spanish. Well, and we'll you will see that. Miles. Correct. Or, or Weissmüller, you know, yeah. uh, like, like Zach's. <laughs> Um, or, or you will find, you know, architecture that is entirely Bavarian, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's actually Vicia General Belgrano, where the Oktoberfest is held, of course. Um, <laughs> you, you will find uh, ethnic en enclaves like that. But the country, um, but people assimilated pretty well. Uh, okay. I wouldn't say that there were, uh, you know, communities that were left out or that decided to stay out on purpose, uh, but, but they, they assimilated pretty well. But the, the, the main problem... It begins with the with the Great Depression, and then uh, in the nineteen um, forties with the rise of fascism. Because if you think about it, Argentina is the only country in the world where eighty years after the downfall of uh, Nazism and fascism, there is still a very popular fascist party. Because Juan Perón uh, was a general uh, in the army in the Argentinian army. He studied under Mussolini, he traveled to Italy while he uh, was president and, and basically in, uh, put in place the same corporatist model, uh, fascist model uh, to manage the country's economy, right? And so this is the time where free enterprise capitalism started to be left out, basically. And this is the time where the government stepped in and 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 this is a time where public spending rose, where taxation rose, where many people started fleeing, you know, and capital started fleeing. This was a trend that was opposite what had happened in the past, say, 60 or 70 years. Uh, suddenly, uh, people wanted to leave the country and not come in. Uh, Argentina stopped receiving uh, immigration, basically. Um, and we started having a, a succession of governments one after the other, who would fight uh, because uh, they claimed that the, the prior one had not been as leftist as the new one, right? Because even the opposition embraced this Peronist model because Peronism was so popular. And it was popular because Peron basically uh, handed out uh, all of the, the money that the country had, you know, uh, until there was none left. And of course, there was also no incentives for generating wealth, you know, because if you're just going to confiscate it the way he did with nationalizations um, and confiscations and, and, and measures like that, well, of course, no one's going to, no one's going to want to give you anything in the future. Um, so, yeah, th this is how Argentina started falling in the indices of uh, economic freedom, but also in terms of GDP per capita, for example, because... Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Argentina was very similar to Australia and Canada. These, these are two countries that are also small in terms of population. They're also huge in terms of, you know, uh, the land that they have. And, and, but the trajectories have been very, very different. Australia and Canada are, you know, part of the first world, if you will. Today, they're rich nations. Uh, they have their problems. But they're nowhere as similar as Argentina, where we have a poverty rate of about 50%. So Argentina is indeed a, a perfect example of what happens when you, when you basically abandon capitalism and, and, liberta and liberalism in, in, you know, in the old sense. Uh, yeah. And so I'm glad that, that Millet talked about this at Davos. And the, um, that, that history likely helps explain partially why Millet is so attuned to the ways that collectivism can come from many different directions. It can come from parties that are more yeah. right-leaning or left-leaning. Um, and uh, Argentina seems like has had mixtures of both of those things. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll get to his definitions of collectivism in a minute, but let's roll the next clip, which is about um, capitalism itself and why he thinks that it is worth Argentina embracing. When studying per capita GDP from 1800 to today, what is observed 
is that after the Industrial Revolution, global per capita GDP multiplied by more than 15 times, generating an explosion of wealth that lifted 90% of the world's population out of poverty. We must never forget that by the year 1800, about 95% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty, while that number dropped to 5% by the year 2020 prior to the pandemic. The conclusion is obvious. Far from being the cause of our problems, free market capitalism as an economic system is the only tool we have to end hunger, poverty, and destitution throughout the planet. There is no doubt that free market capitalism is superior in productive terms. The left's doxa has attacked capitalism for its moral issues, for being, according to them, as its detractors say, unjust. They claim capitalism is bad because it's individualistic and collectivism is good because it's altruistic towards others. And thus they strive for social justice. But this concept that has become trendy in the developed world recently, in my country, it has been a constant in political discourse for over 80 years. The issue is that social justice is unfair and doesn't contribute to general well-being. On the contrary, it's an inherently unfair idea because it's violent. It's unfair because the state is financed through taxes and taxes are collected coercively. I love so, the point that he's making there, which is that collectivism is coercion. Collectivism is coercive. Collectivism is not altruistic. And for whatever reason, that mythology of collectivism as altruism has just seized people's imaginations for so many decades, um, you know, the young and the old alike. And I really love how Malay is just throwing cold water on all of this and saying, absolutely not. Under no circumstances is this actually the thing that truly maximizes good. This is something that coerces other people and uses, um, you know, ill-gotten gains, uh, money stolen via taxation to attempt to enrich the masses in a way that frequently tramples all over people's individual needs and desires. To me, it's just the perfect encapsulation of so much of what is wrong with the West. And he's and I, referencing empirical data to to support that, which is on his side. He, you know, we love our our world and data charts here. This <laughs> is the the hockey stick showing uh, you know massive growth of world GDP over uh, post industrial revolution, and then of course the uh, sh a plummeting uh, share of the population that's living in extreme poverty. Um, so he's he's making that argument, that empirical argument that. Uh, which is very well supported that uh, markets have brought uh, prosperity to the world. Um, but then at, in, at the same time saying, um, you know, the, the left's attacks on this are ill-founded uh, and based on this notion of social justice, which he thinks is flawed. And I, I saw a lot of conversation and, and pushback to his criticism of social justice but um, you mentioned, Marcos, that he came with, uh, you know, Hayek uh, under his arm there. And, and Hayek has also was also a staunch critic of the concept, the, the idea of social justice as at the time put forward by people like John Rawls, uh, which is, you know, the idea that, um, you know, if we put on a blindfold, uh, we want to kind of adjust soci society so that, um, you, you know, the, the veil of ignorance, you are not... Um, that, that if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, you know, your life isn't miserable. And so part of the role of government and pursuing social justice is to lift those people uh, at the bottom and kind of rebalance um, past injustices. And, yeah, Rawls' whole think, theory is basically like, regardless of your station in life, you ought to be comfortable with the, you know, are you comfortable with the system uh, that governs you? Because whether you're a pauper or peasant versus, you know, uh, Klaus Schwab, you ought to, you know, believe that the system serves you uh, equally. Yeah, and the critique of that, of that, it, you know, it, you know, there's, it, it's a, it's a very strong philosophical argument that yeah. it, that it's, it's hard to pick apart. But, um, you know, Hayek's uh, critique of this, and I assume Millet's, he doesn't really go into it in this speech, is that um, by focusing on this. Uh, 
this notion of social justice, which somehow never really gets uh, like concretely defined, you're kind of inviting intervention after intervention, which then creates new injustices. And you're on this like treadmill of constant, you know, rebalancing of past injustices. Which, where This where is so you true, focus. right? Yeah. Like if you look at what's happening in the United States right now, and I want to open the floor up to Marcos to tell us what's happening in Argentina and how Malay believes this like obviously correct thing. Um, but like in the United States, this is what's happening, right? We have the entire legacy of, of slavery and then Jim Crow laws and racial discrimination and, you know, extraordinarily horrible treatment um, of black people on the part of white people. And then what you had was this very brief sort of Obama era of like aspirational color blindness where it kind of seemed like, oh, finally, um, you know, there's pretty solid racial advancement uh, of minorities. And in fact, we are moving toward a system where perhaps it is the content of your character and not the color of your skin um, that is actually the, the, you know, maybe we're moving toward a more meritocratic society. And then for whatever reason, we just scrapped all of that. And circa 2012, 2013, 2014, we've moved into this era of like very toxic race relations where now there's, you know, political correctness and wokeism and uh, DEI efforts to basically do uh, affirmative action on mass with no real end in sight, which was an interesting thing because the Supreme Court, when issuing decision about affirmative action years ago, specifically had liberals and conservatives on the court who were basically saying, hey, maybe affirmative action is only permissible if we have a sort of sunset clause built in, understanding that this is not, this should not be the permanent state right. of affairs. And yet now it seems like in the US, it will be. And so my, my point is just, we went from having horribly fraught race, race relations in the United States to then looking like we were actually going to move past that decently well to now just putting Band-Aid after Band-Aid over this thing that ends up creating far more toxicity um, being seeded by this effort on the part of the government generally to fix what ails people. Uh, yeah, is the so same yeah. thing playing out in Argentina? Yeah, so in Argentina, we don't really have that many uh, race issues uh, itself, just because we this is a pretty homogeneous country. We are receiving immigrants this year, uh, in, in past decades, from neighboring countries. Uh, and they're sometimes, you know, uh, culturally different uh, from us, if you will. But the race uh, relations aren't really an issue. But what it is an issue is, uh, in terms of social justice, is that um, the measures that Peronism, that Peronist presidents, but also others have taken, you know, um, with the goal of helping out the poor, um, have backfired, basically. So mm -hmm. intervention after intervention um, has created a state of affairs where a, a person can receive, um, can basically make the same amount of money if they are on government subsidies uh, that if they work. And that is absolutely um, terrible because then why would you want to work, right? <laughs> if, you, if, you just, if you can just get money from the government and do nothing, why would anyone work? And so you create, you know, generations of people uh, who don't work, who are used to receiving government handouts and who will protest if you try to take them out, you know? If, if you try to tell them, you know, uh, you're going to make less money if you stay at home and do nothing than if you go to work. Um, and so that backfires, you know, in, in the name of social justice, you create more poverty and you create a culture uh, of a toxic culture of not working, um, which is what Millet is trying to go after. Um, yeah. But I wanted to add, um, based on, on what Zach was, was, was showing us, you know, uh, in terms of the, the graphs, you know, the data, that Millet was referencing, that I think um, we, we must stress how important it is to look at this data, you know, at this global data, and, and take a step back and look at what capitalism has done, you know, in the world in recent um, centuries, you know, in recent millennia. Uh, because here in Argentina, for example, I saw when, um, after Millet's speech, I saw some people on the left who were trying to ridicule Millet for saying that the, the world had basically not grown before uh, 1800, which is basically true if you look at the hockey stick, right? Yeah, um, and so th this is something that people don't know. Liz was talking about, you know, earlier about people protesting uh, against the pro-IMF Zionist government 
of Javier Milei, which is total total no, nonsense. But it, it, if I could ask something to these people, is it that you know would you prefer to to live in in this age or or you know in in the I don't know in the 15th century, like free plumbing, what, free running water really, and electricity and cell phones correct. and internet without, and abundant without aspirins, supply. right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just so basic. The, the progress that humanity has made, this is why I love uh, taking a look at the human progress website by Cato too. Um, the progress that the humanity has made is so remarkable that we, we need to repeat it, you know, all over again, because otherwise people keep complaining uh, but we, we but we forget how far we've come, particularly in countries like Argentina, where we have seen decline. Um, we can't forget the progress that other countries have made because that's not magic. That's just you know basic economic literacy. So I, I just want to stress that yeah. too. No, I think that's a that's an important point to stress. And it it you know to to be fair to that you know there are there is a group of libertarians who do embrace the idea of social justice because they say that those of us who care about this empirical data and, and point to what um, capitalism, free, free markets have done, ha, uh, are actually saying that, yes, if you apply the veil of ignorance, then having markets is what will improve society the most and, and lift up those at the, the bottom, you, you know, you can point to that extreme poverty chart and say, you know, this is social justice. Um, but I guess wh where I start to run into problems is that when it's applied in the real world, it's always about, it always seems to turn to, well, it's not quite achieving <clears throat> this exact outcome. And so we need some sort of uh, intervention to rebalance the scales based on this class of person or that class of person. Whereas libertarians, we, you know, the classic way to, to, the, the classic uh, metric or, you know, approach you would use is just justice. Like, and justice is about individuals being wronged and being made whole. You can have class action lawsuits, which kind of, you know, groups individuals who have all been wronged by the same party together. That That's fine. But um, once you start getting to these broad capacious terms like social justice, it just opens the door to all sorts of kind of backfiring interventions. Well, there's um, let's also move on another to, strain, yeah. Well, there's also another strain of libertarians that I think is maybe a little softer towards social justice because there is a sense that, you know, the government has committed horrible, atrocious injustices against certain groups. And we yeah. can pretty cleanly identify who those groups groups are across history. You know, you look at Japanese Americans being interred um, in, in, in concentration camps, essentially in the United States, you look at uh, black descendants of slaves in the United States. And I think sometimes libertarians who are softer towards social justiceism look at that and say, well, wait a second, if we're in any way consistent and principled in our opposition to government coercion, look at the horrific coercive action that governments have taken against these groups yep. of people over time. But the way in which I think they're ultimately really wrong is that uh, attempting to solve this via other government means based off of what we know about how incompetent government pretty much always is, this won't actually solve the problem, nor will it ultimately quell um, people's complaints that there's sort of some sort of grievance, that they have some sort of grievance or that there's been some injustice perpetrated against them, right? Like, I yeah. don't think anything will ever fully make people whole again. And I think it's very hard to suss out which people even need to be made whole. Um, and you you get sort of into a situation where well, you we've got a, we've got a system for doing that, which is taking mm -hmm. things to a court and yeah. so like if you're a family that has been wronged by the federal government, your family was interred uh, during World War II, or you're mm -hmm. a black family whose fa wh whose land was taken by eminent domain, like there are uh, methods for achieving justice, but it has to be much more on an individual case-by-case -case basis rather yeah. than a blanket approach, I think. Yeah, in um, a sense, uh, the OG eminent domain was like, you know, enslavement, uh, but, yeah. you know, we can go over that. And then there's also issues of like the government uh, promising, you know, 40 acres and a mule or, or what have you, and then failing to deliver on certain promises throughout time. So like, I can understand people's intense rage and how that is consistent with libertarianism or seen as consistent with libertarianism. I think some of the trouble lies in how you unravel um, 
those grievances and how you redress them, basically. And I think a lot of the times the social justice friendly libertarians don't answer those in a satisfying way. Let's move forward to the next part of Malay's speech, which is digging into why the West is in jeopardy. Now, if free market capitalism and economic freedom have been remarkable instruments to eradicate poverty globally, and we are presently experiencing the most favorable period in human history, it is worth inquiring why I assert that the West is in jeopardy. The main problem of the West today is that we not only have to confront those who, even after the fall of the wall and overwhelming evidence, continue to advocate for impoverishing socialism, but also our own leaders, thinkers, and academics who, sheltered in a misguided framework, undermine the foundations of the system that has given us the greatest wealth and prosperity in our history. The theoretical framework I am referring to is neoclassical economics. The issue with neoclassicals is that since the model they fell in love with doesn't match reality, they attribute the error to the supposed market failure instead of revising the premises of their model. Market is not just a graphical description of a supply curve and a demand curve on a graph. The market is a mechanism of social cooperation where property rights are voluntarily exchanged. Thus, considering this definition, discussing market failure is a contradiction in terms. There is no market failure. If transactions are voluntary, the only situation in which there can be a market failure is if there is coercion present. And the only one with the ability to coerce in a generalized manner is the state that possesses the monopoly of violence. Each time you want to correct a presumed market failure, inevitably, due to not knowing the market or because you have become attached to a failed model, you are opening doors to socialism and condemning people to poverty. So th this is where he's going right to the heart of what the WF is all about. They're they're not the WF is not a leftist organization. It is, I don't know, a neoliberal or you know he calls neoclassical, um, where they embrace markets on the whole, but uh, they see lots of market failures and say that you know there's a there's a, a need for a strong, robust government intervention to deal with those market failures, things like, uh, you know, pollution, climate change, the government needs to intervene. And Malay is saying, no, you're wrong, uh, Davos crowd, uh, and we're going to do things a different way in Argentina. Is that more or less, are we on, on the same page with like our interpretations here? Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, he, he was definitely criticized um, because of this part, because of the part where he says that there can be no market failure, you know, um, by neoclassical economists uh, in Argentina, uh, just because they, well, of course, they claim that they are. And I think the phrasing could have been differently in that um, the people individually can definitely fail in the market. It's just that, you know, uh, there's nothing that's, that, that can be systemic that cannot be solved by the market itself. Uh, but but you know in other than that I think um, I think your interpretation is right and I think you know what Millet is saying is again is very similar to what we have been hearing um, in Argentina it's just at this time you know because it was in Davos it caught you know people's eye all over the world um, so and I'm very glad that it did because otherwise it would have been just us you know uh, l listening to to his preaching if you will. Um, but, but, but now it's all, it's also you. So do you consider him that. to be a sort of like high priest of Argentine libertarianism? Like, what do you think of the sort of proselytizing? Do you like it? Do you find it creepy? Do you fear that he'll develop this cult of personality in the same way that many other leaders throughout Argentine history have? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit afraid of that cult of personality because I think many people follow him, you know, and, and mm -hmm. not the libertarian ideas. Uh, that he preaches again, um, and and I think that can be that could be bad in case things go wrong. For example, if, if he doesn't deliver, uh, because then people who follow him will not be able to criticize him whenever he fails. You know, whenever he does something that's wrong. Um, many people today, for example, I see that they 
the, the, they they don't want to criticize the government because of anything, even if they make mistakes. You know, uh, just because they want to they want to support Malay all the way. I don't think that's that's very healthy um, because that can lead him to believe that he can you know do whatever. Um, I do believe, of course, he's a libertarian, and I I have confidence. I mean, I voted for him like all the times, you know, in the primaries and the general election and the runoff, and I would vote for him again. Um, but I want him to, you know, be uh, faithful, you know, to to the libertarian idea. Uh, in that regard, I think he was more like a priest when he was campaigning again he's not talking much right now i think that's very strategic i think he has definitely adapted to being president which is a good thing because there was this you know concern that that zach was talking about earlier that he would be you know like trump and he would just keep talking um as president all the time and, and doing nothing um but Malay is not one of those um, I think he, he is like strategically receding, you know, from the public eye as the nasty, you know, job gets done, basically, uh, because, of course, you know, raising revenue for the government is something that, you know, would be unthinkable under a libertarian government. But again, his priority now is to stabilize the country, you know, avoid hyperinflation and then, you know, um, transform the country. Um, so I think that's why he's not talking much. But he can, if things, you know, turn right for him, if he is able to deliver, if if this law uh, that he's um, sending out to Congress gets passed and, and we start to see a recovery, you know, an economic recovery in future months, I think he can be, he can go back to the, you know, to the priest role uh, from which he has receded in recent months. It's it's going to be interesting because he's staking out such th this is a very doctrinaire libertarian position that really differentiates him from the kind of more liberal governance that the WF would suggest, where he's saying literally there's no such thing as a market failure. Um, you know, this I uh, and and so th th it's kind of like where the policy rubber meets the road for a libertarian because there will be situations where uh, some sort of voluntary transaction results in uh, an externality. It results in something that costs other people something. And kind of the, the doctrinaire libertarian approach to that is, well, they should be compensated through, they should be able to bring a suit. They should be able to bring a tort through the courts and get compensated for that. Um, that's not at all how the modern world is governed. We're governed via regulation to uh, avoid those that that kind of extreme liability from like an oil spill or um, air pollution or something like that. So it's going to be, I think, and where it's like something to watch and kind of like uh, empirically observe. Like you know, it first of all, will Malay be able to? to apply that in Argentina, which, which we can talk about later because we can get into the politics. But then if he does, what happens when some sort of environmental cost is incurred? Um, let's go to the next the next uh, clip. Let's keep let's keep forging ahead. Uh, and th this one is where Malay starts to get into the culture wars a little bit, which we've heard him weigh in on in the past. Libertarianism already establishes equality between sexes. The cornerstone of our creed states that all men are created equal, that we all have the same unalienable rights granted by the Creator, among which are life, liberty, and property. This radical feminism agenda has led to increased state intervention, hindering the economic process. It provides jobs to bureaucrats who haven't contributed anything to society. <laughs> whether through women's ministries or international organizations promoting this agenda. Another conflict that socialists pose is that of humans against nature. They argue that humans cause harm to the planet and that it must be protected at all costs, even advocating for population control mechanisms or supporting the controversial agenda of abortion rights. Unfortunately, these harmful ideas have strongly permeated our society. Neo-Marxists 
have managed to co-opt the common sense of the Western world. They achieved this through the appropriation of the media, culture, universities, and yes, even international organizations. The final case is very serious, as it involves institutions with huge influence on the political and economic decisions of the countries in these multilateral organizations. Fortunately, more of us dare to raise our voices as we see that if we don't confront these ideas head on, the only possible destiny is more state, more regulation, more socialism, more poverty, less freedom, and consequently, a worse quality of life. So maybe this is me giving into the feminist agenda, Liz, but I want you to take this first, given kind of how that clip started off. Well, I tend to go back to the old, uh, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg line, amusingly, uh, which is like, I ask, essentially, I ask for no special favors. Um, all I ask is that my brethren take their their feet uh, off my neck. Uh, and it's very much, I think, the thing that's interesting is that today's feminist movement has sort of yassified or girl bossified the Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, mythology into something that like she didn't actually believe. She was legitimately this very old school second wave feminist type that's just like equality between the sexes. That's all you need. You don't really need special treatment beyond that. And that's where I stand. I mean, I don't feel as though my life is made in any way um, worse by dint of being a lady in the United States in the developed world. I mean, that's just a laughable premise to me. And I'm really sick of um, a lot of uh, female complaining to that effect. I don't think there needs to be any sort of government intervention on my behalf to attempt to secure uh, any sort of special treatment for me. I mean, I, I have a wonderful life and I don't need the state to be involved in any way. I also tend to agree with Malay on issues like abortion. I mean, him talking about the population control agenda and the degree to which abortion is very socially, um, you know, permissible in, I know in Latin America, it tends to be regarded a little bit differently, though Argentina, I think, is perhaps in some ways more in line with the United States here. But like, I, I don't feel free by um, being allowed to exercise my right to kill my fetus uh, up until week 24 or 25 in the state of New York, where I live. I don't feel free uh, doing that. I think many other women disagree with me, but you know, I see that as an innocent rights-bearing individual that I believe the state has a compelling interest uh, in protecting. And I believe that feminism can uh, be consistent with that belief. And I feel empowered by being a mom and joyful. So, you know, I'm a little bit of a Malay stand on this front. You guys might disagree. Mar Marcos, it seems like the the economics has obviously taken the front burner at the beginning of Malay's administration here. Like, does do, do these cultural issues still, are they still, like, how at play are they in Argentina at this point? Uh, well, some of them definitely resonate. Um, I wouldn't say that the, the ecological agenda is uh, much important. I don't think it is. Uh, although what, what Malay says, I think, is very important, you know, because it, it is often, you know, assumed that the planet has rights, you know, uh, but, you know, if you take a step back and think about it, you're like, well, is that right? Like, isn't it humans who have rights? I mean, we can debate, right. you know, which, what rights we have, which ones we don't, what, what is a right, but, but does the planet have rights? I mean, can we do, can we take measures, you know, coercively with the force of the state uh, in, in the name of the planet that will harm humans? Um, that, that's, if you put it that way, you know, it's, it's very interesting. And I like that rhetorical, you know, uh, phrasing that the, the, the way that he presents these issues, um, in terms of, uh, feminism, uh, I think that that's an agenda that resonates more here in Argentina. Um, mm -hmm. Millet has been at least partially consequential, uh, with his speech because he demoted, uh, the, the ministry, uh, for women, uh, that had been created by the former, President um, by former President Alberto Fernandez, uh, there was a ministry. Um, the number of bureaucrats had skyrocketed uh, in that ministry. Uh, there was I mean, public spending wasn't super high compared to other expenses, but it was still you know sizable. What did the ministry uh, do? Well, um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I would say that they focused more on you know holding seminars and, you know, 
conversations and, and bringing people together and talking basically tea, about tea you know for the tea parties and yeah stuff. correct correct yeah 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 <laughs> but but you know there were also some like mini scandals you know like I don't know I remember one time um, someone um, someone said and it was true you know we everyone got to see the 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 invoices afterwards that the ministry was buying um trash cans you know at like 10 times the price uh the market price so like you know it, it was just basically used to spend money uh hire a lot of people who um as Mila said don't contribute to the economy but also not necessarily to solving a problem um yeah. e even if that problem is real you know the problem of violence against women although there's also violence against men uh but i mean uh, Millet has been consequential. He shut down the Ministry of, of Women. He can he cannot do much about employees per se, uh, because public employees are guaranteed stability in their jobs here in Argentina. So that's that's tough. That's very tough for any president who wants to fire people, basically, um, because they can only fire the people who they who have been hired um, for a short term, you know, for a defined period of time. Otherwise they can't do anything, but at least the ministry uh, is shut down. Um, and then the, there's this question, this lingering question on abortion. We don't really know what's gonna happen with abortion. Abortion is legal in Argentina. It has been so since uh, 2018. Um, it is free also. You can, you can uh, have an abortion, an abortion at a public hospital uh, and private hospitals are forced to perform abortions, even if they even religious, even Catholic hospitals. That, yes, and that has that mm -hmm. was one of the points uh, of the law that was you know the most criticized uh, back when the law was passed. Um, but you know, Millet uh, received a lot of support from pro-life uh, movements, um, and for many of these uh, movements abortion is the key and, and maybe the only issue that they care about so i anticipate that there will be renewed discussion on abortion in argentina um, maybe not this year but next year uh, i think the priority right now is the economy i think the government is smart enough uh to to concentrate all of their efforts on uh, the economy but at some point i think there's going to be uh, inside pressure from within the government uh, to reopen, you know, the discussion. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Marcos, is, okay, so years ago, I was in Medellin in Colombia, and I stumbled across a thing that I had never seen before, um, which was an abortion-related protest in the streets with attractive young women who seemed urban, educated, well-dressed, etc., and, you know, some older women, too. And my, I didn't know Spanish very well then. I honestly still don't now. Um, but my first uh, assumption was that they were, are, you know, protesting in favor of making, uh, you know, allowing abortion, in favor of pro-choice, in favor of abortion rights. Um, then I talked with some of them and learned, actually, no, it was just this massive pro-life rally. Um, which sort of demographically was confusing to me because I've never seen, you know, you wouldn't go to the streets of Manhattan or Brooklyn and see a bunch of women wearing, um, you know, nice clothes who went to, you know, uh, Ivy League schools or whatever, who are advocating, who are marching in the streets in favor of the pro-life cause against abortion rights, right? So, uh, you know, that's obviously a, a different situation like Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, Chile. I know they all have their own distinct on the ground cultures surrounding abortion. But what's that dynamic like in Argentina? Is there a significant contingent of like women my age who are in that pro-life camp who are vocal about it? Or is it pretty monolithic where people of a certain um, sort of type um, from certain places regionally sort of map cleanly onto the pro-choice or pro-life cause? Like, tell me about what it looks like there. So I, I would say that Argentina resembles um the us uh, rather than okay. colombia at least in this respect it is usually you know if you find a um i mean if you find people protesting on the street and they look like they're you know middle class or upper middle class or they're likely to be in favor of abortion yeah. gotcha. but there are also some circles you know some traditional like particularly in the city of buenos aires you know very traditional uh catholic circles 
or there's strong opposition to abortion uh, from from you know the upper class, you will find those people too. But usually, if you see a demonstration uh, against abortion, it will be people um, who you know are, are not as wealthy uh, as the ones who are protesting in, in favor of it. Hmm. Uh, but but you can have these mixtures. Uh, you can definitely have it, it. It's not as monolithic perhaps as in the U.S., uh, but it's also not as upside down as it can be in, in Colombia. Interesting. Yeah, that's definitely, I almost wonder whether there's like a continuum that could be created of different um, countries in Latin America and the degree to which they do or do not model the U.S. on this, because I've paid a little bit of attention to abortion politics in Mexico. And I'm really curious about how that's going to shake out, especially because in a lot of these countries that we've mentioned, you know, in the United States, we saw the Dobbs decision um, a little bit ago, a few years ago, that reversed essentially 50 years of Roe v. Wade being the law of the land where abortion was broadly permitted with fewer um, restrictions placed on it in many cases with abortions allowed up until, you know, the end of the second trimester uh, in many, many states, um, a later point in pregnancy than many other countries around the world. But the thing that's really interesting is we've seen in a lot of Latin American countries, it's only been in the last five years or so that abortion has been made legal in a lot of these places. Um, and that's sort of an interesting, like, I'm curious about what the di that dynamic will look like going forward. And to some degree, it's like the right feels less enduring and less entrenched if, you know, it was only sort of enshrined in law within the last few years. That's something that can still very much be changed, I think. And I mean, the political results of Dobbs here in the U.S. have been oh, uh, very mixed for uh actually i would say negative for uh yeah. republicans because uh you know these uh it turns out uh lowering the limits to abortion to you know a few weeks is not very popular here um and uh i th that that you know if argentina is gonna uh uh, roll it back countrywide, like, you know, th that would be uh, very different than what happened here in the U.S. where it was kicked back to the states. And um, I imagine there would be quite a quite a backlash to that kind of move. Well, on, we've also know, seen on, an, you know. an interesting um, backlash, uh, an interesting thing in the United States, which is where the mechanism by which these rights are decided has sort of, as it's become, as the right has become imperiled, the mechanism by which people are looking to decide it has shifted. Like we saw instead of this being decided at the legislature level or via you know executive order we've seen like in Kansas for example the constitutional amendment being added uh, and people coming to the polls to vote on this so then basically you have this backlash effect where people are enshrining this in a more enduring way which I think is kind of the opposite of what a lot of pro-life Republicans thought would happen yeah for sure um, and then on you know stepping away from abortion for a second on on the culture war front, um, I do wonder if Millet could uh, be someone to chart a course on like what a libertarian version of engaging in these uh, looks like and how it differs from the conservative version, because he does seem to be pretty focused on just like the government agencies. I mean, he even says in that statement, like libertarians are fully for equality between the sexes, for equality before the law and you know all, all these issues we talked about earlier uh with um you know the the history of black americans or japanese americans like redressing all of those grievances is a tough thing to do and it it ha like it, it's something we're still coping with here in america and that has to play out um in the social realm and and that might involve different uh affirmative action schemes or whatnot at the in the in the private sector but the more that we uh entrench this in the public sector just it seems like the more divisive uh it it it's becoming in, in america you're you're continually dividing people into these official government categories and malay is on a mission to undo that in argentina and it's maybe something for American libertarians to uh, keep an eye on his his approach to that, um, we do we have a couple more clips to get through. Uh, let's go to his next one, which is on socialism and what he says is the socialist takeover of the West. To many, it may sound ridiculous to suggest that the West 
has embraced socialism. But this view is only ridiculous if one limits themselves to the traditional economic definition of socialism, which states that it is an economic system where the state owns the means of production. Today, states don't need to control means of production to control every aspect of individuals' lives. With tools such as monetary issuance, debt, subsidies, interest rate control, price controls, and regulations to correct alleged market failures, they can control the destinies of millions of human beings. This is how we have reached the point where, with different names or forms, good parts of the politically accepted offers in most Western countries are generally collectivist variants. Whether they openly declare themselves as communists, fascists, Nazis, socialists, social democrats, national socialists, Christian democrats, Keynesians, neo-Keynesians, progressives, populists, nationalists, or globalists. In the end, there are no substantive differences. Everyone argues that the state should control all aspects of individuals' lives. If measures are adopted that hinder the free functioning of markets, free competition, free price systems, if trade is hindered, if private property is attacked, the only possible destination is poverty. So th this goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, the Millet kind of broadly defining uh, collectivism and putting all these different variants of collectivism into one bucket. It, it reminds me of, uh, kind of the Hayek's uh, thrust in The Road to Serfdom, the idea that uh, once you start down the road of excessive planning, um, you end up in a really bad place regardless of kind of the political packaging that it's in, whether that's right or left wing. Um, anything else to say on that portion before we move to the final Malay clip, Marcos? Oh, I want to listen to the final one. I, I want to know, I, I want to find out which one you picked as the final one. <laughs> okay, this is his closing statement. Uh, let's see how Malay uh, wrap this up. To summarize, I want to convey a message to all entrepreneurs present. Don't be intimidated by the political caste or the parasites who live off the state. <laughs> Don't yield to a political class that only wants to prolong its power and preserve its privileges. You are social benefactors. You are heroes. You are the creators of the most extraordinary era of prosperity we have ever experienced. Don't let anyone say ambition is immoral. If you earn money, it's because you provide a superior product, better price, contributing to well-being. Do not yield to the advance of the state. The state is not the solution. The state is the problem itself. You are the true protagonists of this story and know that from today, you have Argentina as an unconditional ally. Thank you very much and long life freedom, damn it. Long live freedom, damn it. That is, uh, that is, uh, you That's know, why a very I end all my phone calls. <laughs> Every time I can get off the phone. Yeah, a very Ayn Rand ending to that. Uh, how does that make you feel, Liz? I mean, I feel um, extraordinary joy swelling deep within my soul every time I hear Malay say, Long live freedom, damn it. Um, no, I mean, I think it's it definitely strikes objectivist tones at the very end. And I think it's actually. How insane is it that this stands out to such a degree? Because we've had so few great communicators for the idea that like, no, uh, greed is good. Um, maybe not in such a uh, sort of brusque, blunt terms, but to some degree, I think it's important to sometimes call a parasite a parasite, a leech a leech, and to say, you know, we don't need to have this parasitic relationship with the state. We should not have countries that have that type of system. If you want to pursue making the best possible product and selling it to willing consumers, do that. That's a good thing. That's a cool thing. That's an honest and admirable thing. I think in the US, we saw this bubble up a little bit uh, in the sort of 2013 to 2015 era. I know Arthur Brooks has been a huge proponent of this, the former president of AEI. Um, he wrote that wonderful book called The Conservative Heart. 
and very much espouses this gospel, preaches, to use your word, Marcus, um, this idea of, no, it's actually totally consistent with being a good and moral and honorable person to believe that, um, you know, pursuing, uh, making money and pursuing voluntary means of organizing and pursuing things out far outside of the state, trying to, um, you know, make as much money as possible and then being very charitable uh, with how you use it and not expecting the government to be fixing all of the problems, but rather thinking about more creative and more efficient ways of solving that in your communities. That's a good thing. And that's something we need to see so much more of. Um, so I kind of love the degree to which Malay is really disabusing people of the notion that the only way to be an altruistic, moral, good person is to favor the state giving people handouts. There are so many other ways to be an altruistic and moral person. And I think people like us would probably say that favoring um, redistributive means of providing for the poor ends up not actually providing for the poor. And it ends up coercing a lot of people in the process. There is a better way. And for whatever reason, uh, a lot of people really struggle to articulate that. I think Ayn Rand yeah. articulated that a little bit, but in a pretty obnoxious and horrible way. And I think Malay is frankly doing a much better job. And he's, uh, yeah, it's like he's uh, telling all the business uh, men in that business people in that audience, you know, don't give in to the temptation. <laughs> don't, uh, you know, embrace this WEF, like quote unquote, cooperation between uh, the private and public. Like you need to uh, just, embrace your your inner entrepreneur and he's also reject... buttering them up a little bit right like yeah. he's doing a little bit of that it's a rejection I mean, of he... of crony capitalism which is uh what you wrote about in an article uh uh kind of giving the overview of malay's early days uh marcos you called it argentina's offensive against crony capitalism which we will link uh, in the description here, but maybe we could close out this uh, conversation with you just kind of recapping that, like, why why is Millet on an offensive again? Like, why is crony capitalism really ultimately what's in his crosshairs? Right. Um, well, I think he is going against crony capitalism because he understands that capitalism is supposed to be um, based on free enterprise and that, you know, um, Entrepreneurs are social benefactors, like he said uh, in this, you know, Randesky uh, closing uh, speech. Um, but um, it, that's one thing I liked about. I mean, I like that. I like the speech overall, but I like that part in particular because he's telling entrepreneurs, you know, uh, businessmen, to not be ashamed of themselves, basically, because this is a question of guilt. You know, that why do they do this? Why do they embrace collectivism? If they had been so popular, you know, um, by, by playing by the book, and, and many times it's because they're guilty. Uh, at least th this is what we have seen in Argentina. Of course, there's also people who have, you know, um, stolen wealth basically from the people because the government has allowed them to do so uh, through monopolies and you know privileges, regulations. And right now, Millet is going against this. It's, he's going against crony capitalism because he's trying to open up markets in different aspects. You know, he's trying to, um, for example, he, he's trying to liberate the housing market, which in Argentina had been uh, virtually, um, you know, shut down because of regulations. Nobody wanted to put, you know, an apartment out for rent uh, because, you know, you, you, you weren't able to, um, you weren't able to update, you know, the the the, the fees that you charge in one year in an economy they basically had with two hundred on it. Yeah, like they, they had yeah, rent control, rent control. Yeah. In, in an economy with two hundred percent inflation. You know, uh, right. so that's absolutely insane. But Millet is is going against current capitalism because he is basically trying to uh, tell the businessmen that have lived off of government support, you know you are done this is over i mean we need to mm. um we need to move forward and the the um, and and the, the the people need to to be able to profit you know not not just companies because of regulations and privileges so for example he's imposing an open skies policy and he's rejecting uh price minimums that were designed basically to benefit 
uh, Aerolíneas Argentinas, which is the the state, uh, the government-owned uh, airline, the most um, terrible airline on the planet. Which, exactly, Sweet. which is inefficient, which loses hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and this hurt low-cost airlines. And, and so it was people, you know, regular people were being uh, forced to pay more to fly. Um, but th there's other examples. There's um, the, the, there was the national winemaking policy law, you know, which um, set uh, maximum prices uh, for wine producers, which limited, you know, the amount of wine that they produced in a country which is supposed to export wine, you know. Um, we even had um, something that was called like the supermarket shelf law, you know, which regulated how products needed to be displayed in supermarkets, like literally, you know, so that there would be always, you know, 30% for Argentine products and basically telling consumers what to do, you know. Um, unions, for example, unions were allowed to keep money, to retain money uh, from uh, employees who didn't even want to be unionized um, if they wanted to uh, opt for private healthcare, for example, because in Argentina, unions offer healthcare by themselves, but you can opt out of that. But if you opt out of that, uh, before Millet's decree, if you wanted to opt out uh, of the union uh, provided healthcare system, uh, the union would still keep money just for transferring out that money to a private insurance. So it's wow. dozens, hundreds of regulations like this. You know, the, the regulation that says that supermarkets cannot sell aspirins because it is only pharmacists who can do it you know it's an amount an insane amount of regulations uh that were overturned by the decree or they're likely to be overturned by the omnibus bill um and which is you know the core of Malay's agenda today he's going against current capitalism uh, and he means it i hope he means it uh, i hope all of these things change and i hope that you know, it is the consumers who benefit from capitalism and not cronies, not the friends of government. And every single one of those thousands of regulations or privileges that he's going after just yeah. pisses off some special interest, which likely explains why we're now seeing this massive mobilization in the streets. And we'll be keeping an eye on that and on all the developments and hope that you'll come back and uh, keep us updated on what's going on there, Marcos. Thank you, Zach. And thank you, Liz, thank you also. For, thank yes, you thank you. Me. And uh, thanks for everyone who tuned in. We will see you back here next week. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.